Hello, can you hear me? Help. I don't know what's happening. I don't know if people can hear me or not. Hello, can you hear me? Can anyone hear me? We've been having a few technical problems. Hopefully they, be, they have been resolved. So if you can uh, hear me, you could send me a message. That would be great. So I'm just going to go ahead because I've been given a thumbs up sign, sign by my uh, technical uh, manager who's sitting in the other side of the room here. Thank you very much, Cappy. We'll get started. Sorry for the slight delay, but uh, here we go. You're very welcome to this wonderful adventure on the internet, uh, World Wide Web thing, um, for the festival, the online festival of Ulu. And uh, everyone who would like to join in, I hope you will. And if you have any children, children of an age that would uh, be okay to you know, feel they could join in with things. Um, I have a few stories which are about joining in. One involves a very disobedient child and uh, also we'll be doing a horse race before the end of the session. So my name is Eamon Keenan and uh, I've had the great privilege on numerous occasions of being able to go over to Ulu and sometimes my wife would come along, my wife Pauline, and we've always had such an amazing time at the festival and who knows we might be able to get back sometime but I wanted to talk about the festival because it's such a wonderful event that happens every year Can, yeah it's a wonderful event that happens every year and when I think about it I think of it as being like a treasure chest a treasure chest of precious memories and those memories are of music and of dance and of singing and of poetry and of, um, well, plays, um, sessions in the bar. But most of all, it's all about the people, the wonderful people in Olu who look after us and who organize this event. And uh, I send my thanks and blessings to them. Uh, for all what they've done and I've had so many memories uh, that go back from the very beginning of the festival I just want to share a few in the first festival in 2006 my father went he went over to the festival and um, he opened the festival he, uh, he had this photograph taken he had this photograph taken here and he was very proud of that photograph he, um, he died just a few years after he went to Ulu and uh, he talked about it many times and about the friends he made and how well he was treated and uh, it's great that I've been able to uh, in the past have been able to go over a few times and uh, some of the things that have happened uh, with, the f with the people that I've met will live with me until, uh, until it's my turn to go um, now for example I have this wonderful I don't know if you can see this yeah I have this wonderful badge that was given to me and the badge was made by a friend of mine Miko a wonderful silversmith and it was uh, given to people who'd been involved in the festival over its 10 years and uh, I was honored to be given one of these it's a very precious uh, it, it's so precious to me it's a it's an honor to have been given it but I also have um, have something very very special uh, that was happening to me when I was over one year 
I was uh, doing storytelling. So I did storytelling for adults. And uh, that was great crack, doing storytelling for adults. But not only that, they named a burger after me, Flamin' Eamon. I do not know another storyteller in the world who has been given a burger name, named after them. I may be the only one, I don't know. If you know of anyone, please let me know. And then one year I was there and this, uh, this beautiful uh, lady came up to me and uh, she chanted her song, uh, Yog, um, a song of the Sami people. And uh, it turns out, strangely enough, that apparently on my mother's side of the family, we have Sami DNA. And one of the other most precious memories I have is of doing my first adult storytelling um, in this pub in Ulu. And I didn't know how I would be received, but uh, it was great crack. And um, there was a lady came up to me at the end of it, and she said, that story you told, that story you told really moved me to tears. It was a story about love. So that's the story I would like to tell you now. Just a moment. There once was an island, and on that island lived all the feelings and emotions that ever were. The island was beautiful, and those feelings were so happy living there. But one day news broke. The island was sinking and soon it would be underneath the waves of the sea. Now, some of the feelings and emotions sailed away in tiny little boats, but others remained, including love, for love is ever hopeful. But the day came when it was so clear that by nightfall the island would be underwater. So Love knew she had to leave. And she looked around to see if anyone would help her, anyone would take her away on their little boat. And she saw one boat, and it was the boat that belonged to Riches. And she called out to Riches. Riches, Riches, will you please bring me with you? And Riches turned round and said, Love, my boat is beautiful. It is full of diamonds and jewels and gold and silver. I have no room for you. And so Riches sailed away. Love looked around again to see if anyone else would help her. And she saw Vanity. And Vanity was going past on her beautiful boat. And Love called out, Vanity, will you take me with you? And Vanity said, Love, if you came into my boat, you would mess it up. You would make it untidy. You would wet the boat. I'm sorry, I can't take you with me. Then Love looked around again and saw happiness. But happiness was laughing so loudly. Happiness didn't hear Love's call. And Love looked around again and there was sadness. And sadness was crying and weeping and moaning. And when love called, sadness looked at her and said, I cannot, I cannot be with you, love. I need to be alone in my sadness. Love didn't know what to do. All the feelings and emotions had gone away. But then she turned around and there was an elder in a boat. And the elder looked at her and said, Come, love, come with me. And so love went into that small boat with the elder. And they sailed away and came to a far place. And on the shore, love got out of the boat, turned round to say thank you to the elder, but the elder was gone. Well, love was confused. 
who had helped her. And then wisdom came. And wisdom, wisdom said, said to love, you're confused. You're confused about who that was. And love said, yes, who rescued me? And wisdom said, that was time. For only time knows how precious love is. So that's the end of the first story. Now, this is a story I've told many times. And um, I put a slight Belfast accent on it. I think the story might be German. But however, whenever I tell it, the mammies and the grannies usually just stand there and uh, look at their children. But I'll tell you the story. Once upon a time, there was a child. Now, this child was the most disobedient child that ever was. Well, as far as I know. This child lived in a small village in the middle of a forest with her mother. The child's father had disappeared in the forest some years before. And the child's father, it was said, was taken away by the monsters. But that's a story for another day. So the child, this disobedient child, lived with her mother. Now I'm going to tell you how disobedient she was. If the child was ever asked by her mother to do anything, well, this is the sort of thing that would happen. Her mother would say something like, Dearest darling daughter, would you please go to the shop and get us some bread for our tea tonight? Well, the little girl would stamp her foot, would fold her arms, would put her head to the side, shaking it such as this, and look at her mother and say, Go yourself. <laughs> if her mother ever said, Dearest darling daughter dear, would you please tidy up your room? Well, the little girl would stamp her foot. She'd fold her arms. She'd shake her head and put it to the side. And she'd look at her mammy and she would say, My room, my mess, I'll tidy it whenever I want to. Not when you tell me. So there. <laughs> Now, I know that if there are any good children watching this, well, I'm sure you would never say anything like that to your mother or father, would you? But I did say this was a disobedient child. In fact, she was di disobedient to the point of being reckless. If her mother ever said, Dearest darling daughter dear, it's time to come in. It is getting late, very dark. And you know we live in the dark forest where there are monsters. Please come in. All the other children have gone to bed. Well, she would look at her mother and she would stamp her foot. She'd fold her arms, shake her head like that, and then look from the side and stare at her mother. And then she said, I'll come in whenever I want and not whenever you tell me. So there. Mm -hmm. And the strange thing was her mother never scolded her. Her mother never told her off. Occasionally she would say, one day, child, one day you will learn. And it will be a harsh lesson, a very harsh lesson. And that day came. And this is the way of it. The disobedient child was standing outside her house. Now, you know when you get to a certain age as a child, you get to become a teenager. Well, that's where she was. And she was standing outside her house, looking around, going, looking around to see if there was any business going on in the village. And then her best friend came up. Our best friend was something of a, a child with a very, very 
high wrong disposition. Her best friend came running up. You'll never believe this! You will never ever believe this! Well, the child looked at him and said, what do you mean I'll never believe it? You will never ever believe what I just heard. Well, come on, tell me, tell me. No, you'll never believe it. Go on, tell me, tell me, tell me. Well, do you know your house? The disobedient child looked at her best friend, in fact, her only friend, and said, yes, I'm standing outside. Well, do you know that lane beside your house, the lane that goes into the forest? Yes. Well, do you know when you go down that lane by half a mile, there's an old cottage, an old ruin cottage? Yes. The cottage is not a ruin anymore. Indeed, no. That cottage has now got a roof on it, windows, and there's someone living there. It's a witch. I've been told on good authority, it's a wish, a witch, a horrible witch. Well, the disobedient child looked at her friend and said, I don't believe you. I told you you wouldn't believe me, but I'm absolutely telling you the truth. There is a witch. Well, the disobedient child looked at her best friend and said, why don't we go down and see this horrible witch? Maybe this witch can teach us something horrible to do to all the nice children who do exactly what their mammies and daddies tell them what to do. Uh, no, no, things to do, places to go, have to uh, do something. Bye, said her best friend. The disobedient child went into the house and her mother was standing there and for once her mother was very cross and said, child, have you no sense? Do not even think about going to see that witch. That witch is a monstrous creature who hates children and would do nothing good. Well, uh, okay, whatever, said the little girl and went to her bed very quietly. That night, the little girl waited until her mother was sleeping. As soon as she heard that her mother had gone to bed and was sleeping soundly, the little girl got up and walked downstairs and out of the house and down the dark lane. As she walked down the dark lane, the moon bounced across the sky over those clouds and the trees blew back and forward and the leaves wittered. It was almost as though they were saying, Go back, child, go back. The little girl didn't care. She just wanted to see this witch. And in the distance, <coughs> a wolf howled, shouted to its pack. <laughs> the little girl didn't care. And then she turned the corner and there was the house. And from that house, there was a horrible light. That light, was horrible and green. The little girl was intrigued. So she went up to the window and looked through the window. And as she looked through the window, she saw something horrifying. Oh, it was not the fact that there was an old crone, a horrible looking witch with a big long nose and slobbers coming down her from her mouth, or a big, big pimple on the side of her nose and a wart on the side of her cheek. No, no, no. And it wasn't the fact that this creature had a big pointy hat. No. It was the fact that she was stirring a cauldron. And the cauldron was bubbling. Bubbling and bubbling. Green smoke coming from it. The child looked in stunned amazement. And just then the witch turned round and saw the child. And the witch cast a spell upon the child to tell the child to come into the house and the first time in her life, for the first time in her life, that child had to do exactly as she was told. Even though she was screaming inside, she walked into the house and the witch looked at her and sniffed her. <laughs> I hate children, I hate children. There's only one thing to do with children. 
eat them. But I've already had one today. But I'm cold, so I will turn you into a block of wood, and then I will burn you on my fire. And when I burn you on my fire, my poor old bones will be warm again. The witch began to take out her wand from her sleeve and began to wave the wand around to turn the child into a block of wood. Bang! There at the door was this beautiful creature shining bright, shining bright with love and light and power and strength. And that beautiful creature shouted out, be gone, witch, your doom is now. And that beautiful creature turned that horrible witch into a block of wood. And she burned very well. Well, the little girl who was disobedient all the time, she looked at her, her mammy. For it was indeed her mother was that beautiful, powerful, good, loving creature at the door. And the little girl looked at her mammy and the mammy looked at the girl and the mammy says, now, I hope you've learned your lesson about being obedient. You won't be disobedient anymore, will you? And the little girl, the little girl, the little girl looked at her mammy and said, Oh no, mommy, I'll never, ever, ever be disobedient, disrespectful, or rude to you ever again. I'm sorry, mommy, I'll be good from now on. And indeed she would. She was indeed very good. Now, can I just say one thing? It's just a word of warning, children. Remember this. Never be disobedient, disrespectful, or rude to your mother or your father. Or you never know what might happen. <laughs> so there once was a farmer in Ireland and his name was Patrick now, Patrick was possibly the worst and laziest farmer that ever was you see he wasn't really interested in farming he had a few people work for him but he wanted to become rich really rich he wanted to find gold, the gold of the leprechaun. So this farmer, Patrick, he started to walk all the, all the lanes and he, he, he walked everywhere. He walked to the north and the south and the east and the west and he walked over the forests and he walked through the mountains and he walked everywhere that he could go looking for leprechauns, but he never found one. So he, he would never give up. He knew that he would one day find a leprechaun and when he did he would find the leprechaun's gold for leprechauns keep their gold in a pot and he wanted that pot oh he was very greedy but he never found one no matter where he walked he never found a leprechaun One day, one of his friends said to him, Patrick, you're still looking for leprechauns. And Patrick said, I am indeed. Yes, I am. Well, I have something to tell you. Patrick looked at him and said, Now, don't you be telling me there's no such thing as a leprechaun, for I know there are. I wasn't going to tell you that, said his friend. I'm going to tell you this. You'll never find one. You see, the thing is, we're the big people, and the leprechaun are the wee people. And wherever you go, well, us big people make so much noise that as soon as the leprechauns hear us, they're away. They disappear just like that. Now, all you have to do, if you want to find a leprechaun, is walk quietly. You have to walk so quietly that if you were to walk across a field and there was a mouse there, you could walk past the mouse and you wouldn't disturb it. 
you have to walk so gently upon the earth that if you were to walk through a field a field in the early morning when the dew was on the grass that you would not disturb one little drop of dew on that on those grass blades that's how quietly and gently you have to walk and perhaps then you might find a leprechaun well Patrick was given a mission having to learn how to walk quietly and how to walk gently on the earth and it's much harder than you think it's not everyone can do it maybe you should try it sometime so Patrick was walking along walking along the pathways and the roads of Ireland and everywhere he went he tried to be quiet and he learned how to be really 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 quiet and indeed one day he walked past a mouse that was sitting in the middle of the pathway well sometime later but not too long later Patrick was walking down a lane near his farm and he heard the sound of a leprechaun now in case you don't know this the thing about leprechauns is that their main job is to make shoes he could hear in the distance the tap 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 of someone making a pair of shoes and sure enough he bent down and he looped through the hedge that he was walking along and there on the other side of the hedge there was a little old man in a green coat with a wee hat and a wee pipe and he was singing to himself <laughs> and he was making a pair of shoes on a last little metal bar he was hammering away with his little hammer the most beautiful pair of shoes well Patrick bent down and he reached through he reached through the hedge very very quietly gotcha <laughs> he said gotcha he grabbed the leprechaun and he knew not to take his eyes off the leprechaun for one moment and he just looked at the leprechaun and the leprechaun you know what the leprechaun did this tiny little man who was in his hand he looked it up looked up at Patrick and he said you big people you're the most rude ignorant people there are there's me working hard making a pair of shoes for a friend of mine the king of the leprechauns by the way and you just come along and you just grab the hold of me I know what you're gonna say next well Patrick shook the leprechaun and he says stop your blethering just tell me now and the leprechaun looked at him and said yeah where's your pot of gold that's all you big people ever ask for where's your pot of gold you'd think you'd never say hello how are you how's things going for you what's it like in the world of shoemaking how's your family no you never ask anything like that it's always where's your pot of gold well Patrick shook him again and said I don't want any nonsense from you just tell me where your pot of gold is and the leprechaun says oh I'll show you, show you where it is I'll show you where it is it's at the end of a rainbow and Patrick said ah I know about the fairies I know about all you fairies and the leprechauns and every one of you I know all about you and I know that's a load of rubbish there is no pot of gold at the end of a rainbow that's, that's true isn't it and the leprechaun laughed and said ha, you're quite right you're quite right you're absolutely right but we have so much fun spreading that story and love to see you big people running about after rainbows Patrick said take me to your pot of gold right now uh, you've got me caught said the leprechaun you have me caught we'll go for the pot of gold it's in a field down the hill here so the two of them went across the fields and they walked for miles and miles and miles and miles and then they eventually came to a field and in that field were bushes they weren't the highest bushes they weren't the lowest bushes but there were lots of them 957 
as far as I know, at the last count. Well, the leprechaun took Patrick through the bushes. And right in the middle, he said, that's where my gold is buried, underneath that bush there. And Patrick said, thank you for telling me. He was suspicious. It was too easy. And then the leprechaun laughed and said, hmm. The thing is, it's buried three feet underneath that bush and you need a shovel or a spade and you haven't got one. Patrick was confused. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? I can't let him go. It's too far away to go and get him and come back again. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? And then he had an idea and he said to the leprechaun, here, will you promise that you will not move the pot of gold? for one hour and the leprechaun laughed and said of course I won't no not a problem for me for one hour not a problem and so Patrick got his scarf took off his scarf and he tied it around the bush where he knew that the pot of gold was buried and he tied it tight around that bush you're not moving that gold. I promised, he said, the leprechaun. I promised I'm not moving that gold. And so Patrick went home and he got his shovel and he came right back. And he came back into the field of the wee bushes. 957, as far as I remember. And when he came to the field, he knew he'd been beaten. For on every single one of those bushes, there was a wee red scarf, a wee red scarf, just like his own that he tied up. He knew he would never be able to find the pot of gold. But for once in his life, he caught himself on. He went round and he picked up every one of those scarves. He brought them home and he washed them and he ironed them. And then he took him to the fair, the old Lammas fair at Bally Castle. And he got a wee stall next to a young man from Donegal called Donal, who's been to the uh, festival in Ulu a few times. Well, Patrick, Patrick set up his stall. His stall of beautiful neckties and necklaces and all sorts of things that he put together to try and sell and make a few pounds. But his, his, his scarves, his red scarves, they sold out straight away. They were the most beautiful scarves. And he made a pretty penny. So he went back up to see Donald, who was a man who sold the very best of clothes. Indeed, he sold the very best of hats here's one of them here and then the two of them went up to the pub and in the pub Patrick met a young woman and the two of them got on very well and within a year or two they were married and then there was a few children and Patrick would go out and he would walk around the fields and he would he would walk quietly he walked gently on the earth. And when he heard the sound of a leprechaun making a pair of shoes, he would go over and he would sit down and he would chat to the leprechaun. And he would ask him how things were. And so Patrick had many, many friends. He had a beautiful farm and a beautiful wife and beautiful children. And sure, when you have friends and family, isn't that worth far more than a crock of gold? Now then, unfortunately, um, I'm running out of time. I had so many more stories I wanted to tell, but um, I'm going to have to finish off. But, before, uh, but as I finish off, I'd like to thank everybody for watching. And um, I'd like to finish off with a horse race. It's called the Grand National. 
and I have to explain a few things to you. And I hope you will join in because it's much more fun when you join in than not. So here's the thing. The Grand National. It's the most wonderful race in the whole world. It involves horses. And on the back of those horses are jockeys. And today, ladies and men, gentlemen, boys and girls, you are going to be the horse and jockey. You are going to be in the Grand National. So here's the thing you have to learn. The first thing about the Grand National is that the horses are running. You have to hit your legs like this, like the sound of running. Are you ready? Okay, I'd like to see you doing it now. Well, I'd like to, but I can't. But anyway, can you do it? Are you ready? The horses are running. Excellent. Now then, what's next? So, sometimes the horses are running to the left. And sometimes they're running to the right. Okay, running to the left. Running to the right. Okay, now what else have we got? Oh yes, when they're racing around the racetrack at the Grand National, which by the way is held in Liverpool, England, at a place called Aintree, and uh, run every year. It's the most uh, famous racetrack, or one of the most famous racetracks and one of the most famous races there is. Um, there are hurdles. Now these are big, big fences, and the horses have to jump over the fences. And so, you have to jump. And this is how you jump. Are you ready? Jump! Okay, do you want to give it a go? Jump! Jump! Okay. Uh, sometimes you have a water jump, and this is the water jump. This gets a wee bit technical. Here we go. Jump! Try that at home. Are you ready? Jump! Right. Now, as I've said, this is the most famous race in possibly the world. Um, so very, very important people come along to it. Indeed, because this is in England, the Queen of England has been known to attend. She would come up in her carriage and she would ride around the track and she would wave regally to everyone. So, the Queen, are you ready? Wave regally. Can you wave regally? Okay. Also, there are celebrities. And we have one particular celebrity that is well known, both in England and Ireland, or his mammy comes from Northern Ireland, but he lives in England. And his name is Peter Kay. And he sings a song. And here's the song. I hope you'll join in. Show me the way to Amarillo. Show me the way to Amarillo. That's all there is. Okay? Try it at home. Show me the way to Amarillo. So that's Peter K. Hmm. There are also people called bookies who like to make money of foolish people who bet on which horse will come in first, second, third, or fourth, etc. And these bookies are very keen to find out who's the winner and what they have are binoculars. So this is what the bookies do. Are you ready? Bookies! Okay, try that. Bookies! Hmm. So we've done the jumps, we've done going to the left, going to the right. Oh, there's one final thing. When the race is finished, usually there is what's called a photo finish. This means that whoever, whichever horse comes first, second, third or fourth, whatever, um, well, in case they're running too close to each other, uh, there's a photo taken to find out which horse has won the race. <sighs> photo finish. It's slightly different. This photo finish 
means that when the race is finished and I shout photo finish pull a face you know the way whenever your family get together and hopefully they will be get to be able to get together especially over Christmas the way things are it's very difficult for people but if the family can get together there's usually a photograph taken and usually especially the boys and girls are standing there and they have to have a photograph taken with their mammies and daddies their brothers and sisters their aunts and the aunties the grannies and the grandmas etc etc and you get your photograph taken and most people have to stand there and go right but when I say photo finish I mean don't pull a nice face pull a silly face here's the way to do it so if I say photo finish <laughs> you can pull whatever face you want so you've got all the information and now we're going to go on the Grand National the horses are all lined up they're ready for running and this is now the start of the race please join in are you ready they're off and they're running the hill they're running as fast as they can they're running and they're running to the left and they're running to the left again and they're running to the right and they're running fast as they can up to the first of the jumps are you ready running as fast as you can here we go here we go here we go up to the jump Woo! keep running keep running keep running keep running keep running keep running come right up there is peter k show me the way to amarillo okay keep running 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 there's the burkies here's another high jump it's a water jump are you ready water jump Woo! Keep running, keep running, keep running, keep running. There's the burgies. Keep running, keep running. Here's a high, high jump. Really high jump. Are you ready? Woo! Keep running, keep running, keep running, keep running. Keep running. There's the queen. Keep running, keep running, keep running, keep running, keep running, keep running, keep running. Keep running. Oh, we're going to the left again. I'm back again. We're going to the right again. Keep running, keep running, keep running. And one final jump. Are you ready? The biggest jump. Woo! Now, we're coming up to the end of the race. It's going to be a photo finish. Please pull a, pull a funny face, please. Are you ready? Photo finish. Okay. Thank you very much for listening. I'm sorry I wasn't able to tell all my stories. I would love to have told more, but hey ho. Maybe next year, <sighs> I'm out of breath, maybe next year I'll have the opportunity to hear some of the stories I wasn't able to tell today. But thank you for being here and uh, I hope you enjoyed the stories. And uh, don't forget to uh, watch the other performers, those performers who are going to be on tonight and uh, the other storyteller, one of the other storytellers, Orla, who's on tomorrow. And of course, uh, the, the man himself, Paddy, in the last event, and uh, all those other, all those other people who are taking part. Enjoy this festival, and look after yourselves. So that's bye for me.